All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us again this week for the Ultrasound Grand Rounds. Pretty excited to be back. We had a pretty good week last week talking about ultrasound and AI. Just posted up that video on our YouTube channel. Uh, and today we're going to turn our attention towards the FAST exam. But real quick beforehand, I want to just kind of do a little quick... Um, you know, not shout out, but kind of point out what we're doing here. So this is the in-person uh, version of our ultrasound grand rounds, but all these lectures we post up on our YouTube channel. So just flipping over here, uh, here's an example of kind of our YouTube channel and where we're putting things up. And so really we're starting to do this so that we can get this content, not just out to our people, but kind of spread the word to other folks as well. Uh, and if we can serve as a, a little bit of a repository for some ultrasound education. So on this channel, we got a whole bunch of lectures that we've done over the last couple of years and they've got them broken down into categories and playlists so if you want to go look at a particular playlist you can see you know what we've got there and some topics and i know we were talking about this earlier one of our goals in this particular forum is to really talk through some more um second level, third level ultrasound topics. So not necessarily hitting the core basics. Um, for that, we're going to do some other education both here and hopefully you guys are doing stuff um, wherever you're at, but hitting that next, you know, layer two, layer three, some more in intermediate and advanced topics. And so that's kind of what we're doing here. That's what we're really excited about. Um, and to that effect, we're going to talk a little bit more about nuanced FAST exam today. And so I've got a special guest that I'm going to introduce to you guys here in a little bit about the FAST exam. But without talking too much more about that, let's kind of dive on in and talk a little bit about the FAST exam today. And so today's topic is going to be trace free fluid and the FAST exam, right? And so this is something that comes up from time to time and something that we're going to run across if we do enough scanning. And so if we kind of dive into the lecture here, let's start things off um, and talk, you know, set a little bit of a scenario, kind of get a case going and kind of get our minds primed to think through the FAST exam. And so in this particular case, let's imagine ourselves in the emergency department. Uh, we get paged out for a trauma, right? And so we're rolling down to the trauma bay. Uh, and we're told that we are going to be receiving here shortly a 10-year-old female, right, who was involved in a motor vehicle accident and some complaining of some mid-abdominal pain, right? In this case, you know, just for, you know, HIPAA disclosures, all that is 100% made up, right? I just, it came to my imagine last night when I was writing this lecture, um, but it, it doesn't really... It, you don't really have to think too hard to kind of equate what we're seeing here with a patient that you've probably seen in your clinical practice if you've been doing this for any amount of time. And so this is a generic enough case that it could be something representative of what you'll see um, in a previous shift or in an upcoming shift, right? So 10-year-old little girl, motor vehicle accident, was the restrained passenger in the backseat of a car going moderate rate of speed, mid-abdominal pain. When they show up, right, you do your initial assessments and get some vital signs, right? And the vitals are pretty nondescript for a, a little kiddo, right? So pressures are 110 over 72, heart rates may be a little elevated, but you know what? They just crashed their car. It's a pretty traumatic event. The adrenaline is still pumping. So we're going to, uh, you know, understand that a 105 is potentially normal uh, in this scenario, although it could be a, a harbinger of other things, right? Uh, respiratory rate is 26 and they're setting 99%, right? And all told, their trauma exam, you know, is pretty unremarkable, except for the fact that they got some vague abdominal tenderness, right? And so <laughs> what do we, <laughs> excuse me, what do we do? Let's pull out the, the ultrasound and let's do a fast exam, right? And so as we scan, we scan through and we find this, and I hope you guys can see it, but there is just a very, very, very trace amount of free fluid that's under that caudate lobe um, of the liver there. And so, um, I guess the next question then is, okay, technically we have a trace amount of free fluid. What do we do? Right. Cause technically it's a positive study, right? And so this patient was in a motor vehicle accident. They got some abdominal tenderness. We have a positive fast technically, but if we kind of put our, you know, thinking caps on and say, well, you know, man, it's not much fluid, you know, is this something that is, you know, indicative or indicative of pathology or is this something that I should be running across or could be running across in the normal you know scope of things right so I guess the question is now what do we do right we're kind of in that that realm of well we were hoping for a black and white answer out of a test and we got the color gray and that really kind of complicates our decision making so with that introductory scenario laid out let's just dive a little bit into the fast exam right and get us all kind of caught up to speed so we're all on the same page and kind of do an introductory kind of overview of the fast exam 
And then we'll look at a particular article that I think may be helpful in answering this question. And like I said, I'm excited to bring on a special guest to really dive into some of the nuances of, of this article and this topic. And hopefully we can really get some solid answers so that when we go back on shift later today or tomorrow or whenever we're back, uh, and we have cases like this, we can be equipped and a little bit more armed with information that can be helpful to managing our patients, right? So fast exam, right? If you think back big picture, right? Um, the goal of the fast exam is the detection of free fluid, right? And I love to kind of simplify things, right? Take a, a very complex, nuanced topic and just kind of back up for a minute and see the big picture and how this particular topic, this test, whatever, fits into the whole, right? And so if we do that, if we back up at that 30,000 foot view, if you borrow the airplane metaphor, right? The big picture goal in this patient is the detection of free fluid with the FAST exam. Because what we want to know is in this patient who's got, you know, been in a decently high speed car crash and they got some vague belly pain, are there injuries, right? And not just are there injuries, but are there life-threatening injuries? Because if you've got a, a small little, you know, subcutaneous hematoma, technically it's an injury, but I don't really care, right? That will get better. But if you've got some massive, you know, mesenteric bleed, or if you've got some bowel or viscous injury, you know, a, um, a liver lack or a splenic lack, those I care about, right? Those are, you know, I want to know about because there's going to be different treatment pathways for each of those, right? And so our goal with the FAST exam is to uh, use it as a tool to help us decide whether or not there's free fluid in the abdomen. And then from there, based on your location of practice, right? Based on the patient's presentation, based on the vital signs, all sorts of other things, that answer, yes or no on free fluid, is gonna inform what you do, right? And I think that the standard boards question is positive fast equals OR, while not untrue, from a board standpoint, may be more nuanced when you get to a high level trauma center uh, versus if you're out in a community shop, you know, in, in rural fill in the blank, right? And so the answers may be slightly different for your own particular practice, but we want to know, is there free fluid? Yes or no, right? And so with that said, what does free fluid look like, right? And so free fluid is going to be in the abdomen and it's going to take, or in whatever space it's in, and it's going to take the space of the container that it's filling, right? And so if it's free fluid, it's not going to be contained by the wall of a viscous, right? It's going to be excluded from those things. And so it's going to be in between all these different structures that we find in the area of concern. So, I mean, I'm kind of dancing around the belly. Um, you will talk in a slide here about the different parts of the fast exam, but for the belly, for example, it's not going to be inside the intestine. It's not going to be inside the gallbladder. It's not going to be inside the bladder. That's all normal fluid. If we're looking for fluid that's excluded from those places, that's outside, right? That's filling that external container. Um, that's what we're looking for. In the immediate phases, that fluid is decently anechoic, right? So it's black, right? What you see here on the left-hand side of the scale. But as that fluid sets, right, as that blood kind of settles in and coagulates and becomes a clot um, in the first, you know, minutes to hours of the patient's presentation, that fluid's going to go from being anechoic to echogenic, which makes the FAST exam actually a really, really complex and nuanced study to perform as you get more reps under your belt and kind of start seeing more and more patients, right? Um, and then over time, you know, days, you know, days later, after the patient's well out of the ED, that fluid is going to kind of liquefy again and, and be reabsorbed, right? So it may turn back into anechoic. Um, but in the first, you know, handful of hours, right, we have either the anechoic or the echogenic fluid, right? And that's what we're looking for. Now, the FAST exam itself can be broken down into three categories. And I really like to think about it as three books on a shelf. So the FAST exam is the shelf right? And there's three books on that shelf that comprise the different components of the FAST exam. They look for three different things, right? Uh, and you do them with, you know, in, in three different locations and kind of three different ways, right? Um, and those different categories are abdominal, the abdominal FAST, the cardiac FAST, and the thoracic FAST. And so big picture, when I have a patient who's in the trauma bay, who's really decompensating, right? Their blood pressure is tanking, their heart rate's high, they look like they're in hemorrhagic shock, from their trauma, the questions I want to ask myself is where is that fluid? So I know which compartment to intervene upon first, right? And so if you think about it, the major compartments of the body are going to be the head, the chest, the pericardial space, the belly, the retroperitoneum, 
your muscular compartments, oftentimes known as the thighs, right? And then on the floor, right? We'll just consider that to be an extra compartment because blood can go there, right? And so the FAST exam can really help us divide those different compartments and say, okay, is it here? Is it here? Is it here? What's my highest priority for intervention, right? And so that's a good way of structuring it, but it's also a good way of breaking it down and teaching it, right? So the first compartment, the first thing is that abdominal compartment of the FAST exam. And so if we look specifically in the abdomen, our goal, right, the goal of the FAST exam is to identify hemoperitoneum. Um, so fluid or blood specifically in the peritoneal space, right? Um, and the assumption is in a traumatized patient, right? If you see fluid in the belly and they're otherwise healthy, right? That fluid is from an injury, right? Um, now we all know this to be nuanced, right? If you have a patient who's got really bad liver failure and ascites, they can have fluid in their belly at baseline, right? And so you have to understand some of the clinical um, nuances to really interpret this one fully. But if the average 25 year old person comes in after a car crash, right? And they have fluid in their belly, you have to assume first that it's from their injury, right? And then go find the injury and treat that um, and use a fast exam to kind of steer and guide and direct that, right? And when you look at it that way, the sensitivity of the fast exam is actually pretty decent, right? It's not amazing, it's not perfect, but you're gonna have decently high sensitivities approaching the 80%, decently high specificities approaching the 100% if you're looking at uh, specifically for hemoperitoneum. Now, if we try to use the FAST exam to explain all injuries, well, that kind of falls apart and your sensitivity drops profoundly. Um, but when we do the FAST exam, looking for that free fluid, we want to look at the various different gravity dependent areas in the supine patient, right? And those three th areas are going to be three. They're going to be the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, and the pelvis, right? The super or the, 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 the area just around the bladder, right? And so these are going to be the three basic windows of the abdominal portion of the FAST exam. So the right upper quadrant, we're looking at that liver kidney interface, right? That Morrison's pouch is the name for it, um, but it's the um, that potential space, right? That bright white line between the liver and the kidney there uh, as fluid is going to gravitationally, preferentially descend kind of down into that sac. Now, the nuance there is oftentimes if the fluid's coming from somewhere else in the belly, it's got to migrate up there. And so you may earlier see it at that caudal tip of the liver. Uh, and I'll show you a couple slides in a couple slides what that looks like. Um, so it may be migrating in there, you'll see it at the tip of the liver, and then it goes into Morrison's pouch, but that's going to be where you're looking in the right upper quadrant, right? Now, if we switch on over to the left upper quadrant, what we're looking for is that spleen and that kidney in the diaphragm, right? So you want to look between the spleen and the diaphragm, right? That bright white crescentic line that's kind of on the left-hand side of the image, that mid gray structure, that's your spleen, right? We're gonna look in between those two because that's the most likely place that fluid's gonna collect in the left upper quadrant. And then secondarily, you wanna look between the spleen and the kidney because it can potentially collect in that space there. Although getting through that, what the framing of Winslow and kind of into that sac is gonna be a little bit more challenging. Um, but those are the two different places that we can look for fluid in the left upper quadrant, right? And then if we move down to the pelvis, right, here's an example. Um, I like doing the, the pelvis view in sagittal orientation because it gives me a view of the intraperitoneal space kind of on the left-hand side of the image. And then that bladder, which is in the pelvic space on the right-hand side of the image. And if I scan from side to side, from iliac crest to iliac crest, it gives me a nice sweep of what's in that pelvic area. Uh, and the fluid's going to collect just to the left-hand side or to the caudal, or, um, or the cephalad side, excuse me, uh, of that bladder on, on the left-hand side of that image there, right? So these are, the last three images you saw are normal, right? These are what the normal negative FAST exam looks like. Now, if we want to make that positive, here's an example of a right upper quadrant with some free fluid, the anechoic free fluid in the right upper quadrant, kind of starting to go into that Morrison's pouch space. And then if we go down just a little bit further, there's going to be some fluid at that liver tip, right? That, um, that tip of the liver, that anechoic kind of stripe down there. And then what I mentioned, you first time, sometimes the first time you often have see it, well, that's actually the left side. Um, but you can actually see that, you know, that first time, sometimes the first time you see it is that that caudal tip, right? Here's an example of the left, right? The same phenomenon can happen there, uh, where you can see that fluid kind of along that, that the inferior border of the spleen. But like I said, most commonly, what you're going to see is that stripe of fluid between the diaphragm and the spleen, kind of as it collects kind of in that sub diaphragmatic area on the left hand side.
Now, moving down to the pelvis, right? Here's an example uh, of free fluid external to the bladder, right? Just north or uh, to the left of the, the bladder in the, in the pelvis. And you can see some loops of bowel that are kind of floating in there, kind of adjacent to that bladder. But this is going to be a positive fast exam in the pelvic window. Now, I did mention earlier that one of the things you got to be careful with is the fact that that fluid can, if it's blood, can clot, right? And so here's an example uh, of a patient with clotted fluid. And this is easy to kind of let your eyes just pass right on over and not, not see it. But if we break this image down, you see that bladder on the right-hand side, right? That anechoic rounded structure, that's the bladder, right? If you look towards the left, kind of halfway down the image, you see kind of an oval shaped thing that's really vague kind of vague oval shaped thing that's kind of inside the midst of a whole bunch of other you know um mid-gray echogenic stuff that that oval shaped thing is the uterus right so there's a bladder in the uterus and then right above it uh, is that mid-gray just decently homogeneous in this image uh amorphous thing that's not supposed to be there and that's clot right that's clot between the uterus and the bladder right and so that's something that you have to kind of be on the on the lookout for as you're doing your fast exam but this is an example of the three basic abdominal windows of the FAST exam, the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, and the pelvis, right? Now, if we move up to the, the, the chest, right, we can take the cardiac book off the shelf um, and say the goal here is to look for hemopericardium, right? Uh, look for fluid kind of around the heart. And the thought is, if I've been recently traumatized and I'm otherwise normal, healthy, all those caveats that we just talked about in the belly, if all that's true and I have fluid around the heart, that we have to assume first that that's from your trauma, right? And that's going to accumulate decently rapidly. And then you're going to progress to tamponade and die, right? And so that's the thought. And so we're looking for a free fluid in that pericardial sac. And we can do that from one of two windows. We can do it from many windows, but one of two basic windows um, that will have you know work in most of your trauma patients, the subcostal window, right? The subxiphoid window or the parasternal long axis window kind of up on the chest, right? And so here's an example of the subcostal window where you're looking underneath the ribs, through that liver, you can see um, the four chambers of the heart and then a, kind of a vaguely bright white line that surrounds the heart. Uh, and if we saw hemopericardium, we'd be seeing fluid, a stripe kind of in the, the place of that bright white line, right? Um, we can go up to the parasternal long axis view, right? And so this is gonna be a view from the chest, right? You can see the left ventricle there and the bright white line underneath it, that's a pericardial space. Uh, and a hemopericardium would be filling that particular space. Right. And so, like I said, we're, we're looking for hemopericardium. That's our goal here. And so in this situation, here's the patient with a small effusion, right? And you see that echo, or that anechoic stripe that's surrounding the heart. You can see it in the gravity dependent area, just beneath the, the myocardium of the left ventricle there. Right. And if we go to another view, this one's in a lot worse shape. So this is a patient with, you know, tamponade essentially, uh, but you can see that anechoic fluid that's surrounding and bathing that heart uh, and that's preventing that heart from filling, you know, thus causing their, their tamponade physiology, right? So that's an example of the cardiac um, portion of the FAST exam. And then finally, the thoracic portion. We'll spend a little less time uh, on this one because it's not necessarily as pertinent to the question about trace-free fluid in the, in the belly, but just for completeness sake, we'll, we'll mention it here. And the goal in the, the thoracic portion is to diagnose or evaluate not only for fluid in the chest, right? The hemothorax, but also for air in the chest, right? Pneumothorax, right? Because the FAST exam can actually decently well evaluate for both of those, right? And so we're going to look uh, on the anterior chest as well as in those right, up, right upper quadrant and left upper quadrant windows that we already looked at, right? And so if you go to the the anterior portion of the chest, you can see this pleural line. You can make that active here. And that, that sliding back and forth of the pleural line. And the presence of that indicates that at that location, there is no collapse of the lung, right? Those The visceral and parietal pleura are adjacent to one another. And if you lose that sliding, it is suggestive, although not completely diagnostic, of a pneumothorax, right? You have to consider other entities like, you know, a talpleuridesis or a... Um, uh, you know, or apnea and things like that, you know, where there, you wouldn't have that sliding in, in reasons in, in other reasons. Right. So here's an example of lack of sliding, right? So you can see that pleural line just beneath the rib surface and there's nothing moving there. And so in the right setting, right. With the right findings, uh, this could represent a pneumothorax in this patient. And the test characteristics are actually decently good to, to, to show that. Right. Um, the way to really confirm that is to, to show the presence of a lung point, which you see in this slide, basically, um, part of the pleural line is moving, 
part of the pleural line is not, and you see that that separation between where that movement and lack of movement occur. And if that happens in the chest where you expect to see a pleural line, well, then something's peeling that visceral pleura away from the parietal pleura. Uh, and generally that something is air, right? Uh, M mode can help differentiate this looking at the sandy beach for a normal versus the barcode sign for an abnormal. Okay. And if we want to change over to the hemopar or hemothorax uh, side of the world, right? Uh, you're basically looking for that anechoic fluid in the pleural space. And so here the anechoic fluid is filling that pleural space, pushing that lung material up to the left uh, and kind of bathing that material kind of in that, that, that um, confined area. Right. And so when you do your right upper quadrant view and your left upper quadrant view, you can look up and see if there's any fluid kind of in those pleural spaces, right? So those are the three basic windows of the FAST exam, right? Like I said earlier, the question then becomes, what do you do with findings there, right? Do you have a positive finding versus a negative finding? What do you do with that? And the, the board's answer is, you know, blood in the belly, they go to the OR, right? Uh, blood in the chest, they go to the OR, right? Blood in the, in the, thoraces, right? Chest tube, right? Um, again, I don't want to get into all the nuances. We've talked about this on this channel before, um, but also, you know, it's, it's a very com a long, complex question of if you're in a high level trauma center, what do you do with the findings? If you're out in the community, what do you do with the findings? Um, but generally, you know, the, the question that we're trying to answer is, is there something there that we need to deal with, right? And so as we get back to our patient, let's skip too far forward. As we get back to our patient, right? We have this, right? A pediatric patient who rolled in, we scanned their belly and we found a little trace bit of fluid, not a ton, a trace bit of fluid, a couple cc's here. And so what do we do with this? Is this a, is this a positive? Do we need to scan the patient, like CT scan the patient? Do we need to admit the patient? Do we need to X slap the patient? Probably not the best idea for this one. Um, what do we do, right? And so there's an article that was published a couple years ago. Let's see, it was published in 2020, right? In the, in the Journal uh, of Ultrasound and Medicine. Um, and basically they attempted to answer this question or at least the question of, you know what? man, this seems like so little fluid. Is this something that we can find normally or is this something that's abnormal, right? And so what they did is they took uh, a ton of patients, a ton of uh, a ton of pediatric patients who were being evaluated in the emergency department for, for other things, really. They weren't trauma patients per se, um, but they wanted to see what is the rate of physiologic free fluid in these patients, right? And so um, their inclusion criteria was basically, and I'll go to the flow sheet here, um, their inclusion criteria was previously healthy patients um, in the ED between the ages of one and 17, right? Um, who just presented to the ED, right? They excluded uh, any kids with um, any abdominal, pelvic, or GU complaints, right? Including trauma, pain, acute infection, um, a history of, of, of chronic diseases like cardiac or GI or renal uh, or GU diseases, Um Recent diuretic use, recent abdominal surgery, um, you know, can exclude those patients. So what they're trying to do is say, okay, what are the patients that might, for reasons other than just their normal, have fluid in their belly, right? We don't, we know they're going to have that. Like, what are the normal patients? If you're just like some random kiddo having a fun time and, you know, otherwise came in as a trauma, what's your baseline rate of having free fluid, right? And so they enrolled those patients, right? And then they went and scanned them. They did the ultrasound and they went back and looked and said, okay, how many of the kids had free fluid? How many of these kids didn't? And is there a difference based on your age, right? Based on your, whether you've hit puberty or not. And is there a difference based on your gender, right? Because the traditional thought is, well, I guess, you know, women can have, you know, this, this free fluid, maybe guys don't, right? Um, you know, based on, you know, you know, period cycles and stuff like that. So, is that a factor, right? And what they did, uh, they broke it all down and they got their data, right? And so here's uh, the characteristics of their patients with free fluid and without free fluid, right? And they did a pretty pretty decent job uh, enrolling an even cohort um, of, of, of patients, right? And, and I didn't show it here, but in table one, they give their demographics and they said um, 175 of the patients were, were boys, 150 of the patients were, were girls. Um, and they're almost evenly split between prepubescent and pubescent uh, males and females. There's 100 um, prepubertal boys and 75 of all the other categories, prepubertal girls and postpubertal boys and girls, right? Um, 
And so they scanned those, right? And they got these findings. And if you look at the bottom of this graph, right, or this 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 table, it will show you that they had a small amount of free fluid in a, in a decent number of patients, right? So if you go, uh, I guess the mid portion of the table, all prepubertal kiddos, right? About 20% of them had some degree of, of free fluid, right? If you took all pubertal kiddos, about 11% of them had some degree of free, free fluid. And you can break it down by gender, right? And see that. Um, and then you can break it down and say, okay, how much free fluid do they have? And the ones that had the most in terms of quantity was your pubertal females, right? At um, an average of of um, three um, three ish mLs versus you know less than an, uh, one mL in the other ones, right? And if you look at where they found it, all of the fifty two patients with positive free fluid they found in the pelvis, right? They didn't find any in the right or left upper quadrants. So interesting data. It's one study, right? So this isn't um, not something that's been replicated to say you only get free fluid in the pelvis, you'll never get it up in the, the upper quadrants. Um, but it's kind of reflective of what we may see, right? And so here's some examples of, of images that they showed, right? So the, the bladder, you know, the transverse and sagittal orientation, you see this small little pocket of fluid. And if you go back and read the study, they had a way of kind of measuring the pockets and doing some math and figuring out how much fluid is there. Um, but the, all of those patients had a pretty small amount of free fluid kind of in their pelvis at their baseline, right? And so here's a study, and this is not alone. There's another one that um, that they reference in their paper that says that you can have trace amounts of physiologic free fluid in pediatric patients, right? And so if we go back to our patient, right, uh, we see this finding on our scan. Now, granted, it's right upper quadrant, so it's a little bit different, right? But it brings the question of, is this physiologic free fluid in this patient. I mean, you can see we're using the linear transducer. We had to work pretty hard to find that, right? The I, My memory of this case is that we scanned it with the curvilinear. It's like, that something looks funny. And we switched to the linear to get a little better view. And we found this, right? So with that being said, I'd like to bring on our special guest today. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about this for, for a little bit here. So I have joining us uh, Dr. Casey Kohler, one of our trauma surgeons here at Metro Health. So um, Casey joined us a handful of years ago um, and she comes up, I believe she said from Parkland Hospitals where you did your training, uh, the famous Parkland Formula Hospital, right? For all your burn, um, you, you burn interested people. But Casey's one of our burn surgeons here. She's one of our trauma surgeons. She and I have worked a number of shifts together um, over the time that you've been here and we've um, brought you on to kind of talk a little bit about uh, about this. But Casey, before we get rolling here, just tell me a little, tell us a little bit about yourself, your training, kind of set the stage so that those who are with us now and who watch it later kind of know a little bit about you. Okay, so I guess I started my medical adventure um, as an EMT, actually in Albuquerque, New Mexico, working in a high volume um, 911 system, which is Really, I always wanted to be a doctor, but that's what got me mostly interested in trauma. Um, I did my medical school at University of New Mexico, uh, which is very interesting to do because we only have one level one trauma center, one only one tertiary center in the whole state. So as a med student at the only tertiary center, I actually got to see a lot. I ended up doing my residency in general surgery at SUNY Downstate and Kings County in Brooklyn, New York. Um, which is also a very high volume center. And actually, as far as trauma, was one of the champions of non-operative trauma for solid organ injuries. So uh, they were the ones back in the late 80s, early 90s that really started pushing that. And then I did my fellowship, as you said, down at UT Southwestern and Parkland Hospital down in Dallas, where um, I discovered burns. So now I do burn and trauma here in Cleveland. Sounds great. So you've been all over the place. Um, basically all points of the compass when it comes to, um, to medical care in the United States. But, um, I guess as we dive into this, um, maybe I'll just kind of open up broad and we can narrow down to some specific, um, uh, scenarios later, but what do you make of this data? Uh, I know you're just seeing this kind of now for, um, you know, for the first time, but what do you make of the first time, at least in this con context, but what do you make of this data about trace flu free fluid in the pediatric fast exam? Does that kind of fit with your, your practice, your understanding of things? Kind of go ahead and talk a little bit about that. I would say I was definitely, I was not surprised that all the free fluid that they found is in the pelvis. Uh, 
I would say most of the time when you see physiologic free fluid, it's almost always in the pelvis. You usually never see it anywhere else. Um, I was surprised how many of the males showed free fluid, though. Uh, the females, I would have expected, like you had talked about before with menses and things like that, you see that more in females. So I think it's good to know that there's also a normal amount of free fluid that you would find in males as well which could make you not necessarily go directly towards injury if it's a small amount, that it could just be their normal baseline. So I'm putting this graph back up so we can look at, back at this one. Yeah, and the overall number, um, I didn't mention it earlier, but the overall number, if you just want a, a one solid number to kind of put in your head, uh, for those of you guys who are watching, uh, that they published in this study was that there was a, a rate of 16% of children, kind of if you averaged everything out, uh, had this trace physiologic free fluid in their pelvis. So um, I guess the question then becomes, okay, so we know this is an entity, right? Now, um, you know, so if I go down to the department right now and scan, you know, a hundred kids, theoretically, I should come up with about 15 or 16 of them with trace free fluid. Okay. But let's layer on top of that trauma. Cause what they didn't do in this particular study is they didn't necessarily include people who had trauma to the belly. Right. And so if you layer on trauma, how does that make you kind of think about the data that's being presented here? Or does well, that change? I, think, I don't know if that necessarily um, changes how you think about the data. I mean, I think if I saw fluid in the pelvis in trauma and it was a very small amount, you're like, this could be physiologic and you would start, you know, thinking about further steps that you had to do. If it's up in the right or left quadrants, then I would think the fluid would more than likely be related to the trauma. But I think this is where you have to start coming into, you know, what we talk about the art of medicine. Um, you know, in trauma a lot, we do a lot of things that are protocolized, but that's the beauty of medicine is there's still an art to it. And you have to be able to identify by your patient. And I would say, and what they're showing you clinically to kind of determine where you need to go from there. And this would just still be one more point of information to be able to make your next clinical decisions from. So you, you hit on that a little bit and I had this question further down the list, but we'll bring it up here. I know this article is one article, right? There's um, not a, uh, an exhaustive um, you know, treatise on this subject, but does location make a huge difference for you and what would you do differently if you see the free fluid somewhere other than the pelvis or would you do anything differently you know assuming um let's just start with the assumption that the patient is otherwise completely clinically asymptomatic and their trauma was and, and they look great right and then we can throw on you know some other scenarios to kind of complicate things a little bit so if it's in the right upper quadrant, like the image I showed, or if it's in the left upper quadrant, would you do anything different reflexively? I'm trying to, th I, I think that even, I guess it would depend on what the patient was presenting with. If the patient was presenting, like you said, this 10 year old with some abdominal pain and had fluid, it, mm -hmm. to me, it probably wouldn't matter any quadrant that it was in, I would probably continue with some other tests and some observation to see where I would like to go with this. You know, things like a lipase, um, hemoglobin and hematocrit. And, you know, I would probably say observe at this point because it's not a lot of fluid and the vital signs are stable. Mm -hmm. So I think there would be an observation period where you would continue to examine if the patient was reliable uh, and follow up on your lab tests and kind of go from there. Um, but I think a lot of it too, and it's really hard to pull it out is your mechanism. You know, I think if you had a low mechanism of trauma, like say this was a kid who fell off a bed and was complaining of abdominal pain and you had a small amount of fluid that would be less likely to trigger more of a workup than a patient who was in a high speed motor vehicle accident. Gotcha. Um, so, I mean, one of the questions that I had, and I think we've, we've kind of answered it a little bit. Um, so maybe I'll just reframe it in terms of a, a recap here is the story matters a lot in terms of the, the, how the clinical, uh, how the patient presents clinically. Right. And so if they have zero abdominal tenderness, right, it, it's a less of a finding, right. If they have decent amount of abdominal tenderness, then this becomes a little bit more concerning. 
um, is there besides labs and observation, is there any reason or is there any threshold that you would find for scanning a patient reflexively based on these findings? Let's say they had some abdominal tenderness, or are you always going to kind of go that labs, you know, kind of watch them for a little bit in the department? I guess hypotension would be one of them, but yeah, if there was hypotension, if they were having really, um, you know, ex like excruciating pain, if it was very tender on exam, I would also say if you started seeing, you know, signs of, say, like a seatbelt sign on exam, um, if you were concerned about, you know, thoracic trauma, if you were concerned, you know, if they had something also, if you happen to find a pneumothorax when you were doing your fast, mm -hmm. um, you know, or you were concerned about broken ribs or things along those lines, I think where it's sent a lot more um, serious, then I would probably go straight to a scan. I think if you had more fluid as well, a scan. And I think the other thing too, well, you talked about the story, but, you know, say you found a kid who was in an accident who, you know, someone died on scene or there were some other like major um, contributing factors. I think I would have a much lower threshold to scan them. Sure, that all makes sense. Um, I guess the other question is, okay, so they have eh, an okay mechanism, right? They're in a 30 mile an hour car wreck, right? They have their seatbelt on, but now they got some moderate abdominal tenderness, right? Their vitals are normal. You know, they look pretty good, right? And you find this trace free fluid on the exam, right? You can put it whatever quadrant you want, pelvis, if you want to make it easy. Uh, so it's not like a slam dunk, go home. It's not a slam dunk, we're going to you know, do this million dollar workup. Um, does the, do these kind of findings reflexively, um, oh, how's, how do I want to make ask a question? Do, would you reflexively then admit these kids for observation, right? And then I guess what would be your threshold for saying, let's observe in the ED for a couple hours versus let's bring them into the hospital? So I would say if, you get to the point where you're not going to scan, I would definitely observe them. And I think that I know it's hard because a lot of times in the ED, you guys really want a disposition. I think that sometimes it has to be fluid. So you could say I would get, you know, labs now, and I would say at least six hours, maybe get a second set of labs, make sure hemoglobin and hematocrit are stable. I would also make sure that you PO challenge them. Because if their abdominal pain gets worse when they eat, I'd be more concerned for a bowel injury. And especially kids are notorious, right? You always hear about with bicycle accidents and things like that, that they have duodenal injuries. Um, so I think you would have to do at least a PO challenge. I would probably at least want two sets of hemoglobin and hematocrit to show it's stable and reevaluation of the abdominal exam. And then I think you could decide from there if they needed to stay overnight or if, you know, they would be able to go home. And I think a lot of this too is because we treat so much of our solid organ injuries um, not operatively now that you have a much better chance of being able to observe because even if you got a CT scan and there was a grade one liver lack, it wouldn't change your management. You may keep them the whole night, but um, it really wouldn't change much of what we did as far as like going to the operating room or something along those lines. And I think that's actually probably a really good point to make um, for those people who are who are listening in, who may not have the luxury of working at a, you know, a busy level one trauma center um, is, you know, the while the board's answer for positive fast exam equals OR, right? The practical response um, to a positive fast exam doesn't necessarily always equal that, right? And so you have to consider what the exam is trying to give you, um, but then also kind of you know, it was a, a mind, one of the big minds in emergency medicine says, you need, you need to know what you need to know plus the next level up. Right. And so for us in this situation is like understanding it's helpful for us as ED physicians to understand, okay, what are the trauma surgeons going to do with this kiddo who has a traumatized abdomen, even in the event that it is, uh, has, has a splenic or a, a liver injury. Right. Uh, and so that may not necessarily equal the OR, right. It may, maybe IR, maybe observation. And so, um, you know, for those people who, who d may not be seeing as much trauma, may not be working at a level one trauma center, if you're getting a, a, you know, a response from a trauma surgeon, Hey, like, let's reevaluate them in a handful of hours, you know, with some, some repeat labs and a repeat belly exam. Uh, 
you know, that may not be an unreasonable thing that you have to escalate up the, you know, you know, the chain of command as it were. So I think that's a really important thing that, that you brought up uh, in that capacity. And I think, you know, it's one of those things that the, the purest for, from the ultrasound standpoint or the purest from the trauma standpoint, this is a, it's a, it's a challenging topic, right? Because the, the test itself doesn't perform at a hundred percent sensitivity and doesn't, it doesn't perform at a hundred percent specificity. And so there's a, there's a, um, a tendency for those who like the test to to do it and to overrate it. And there's a tendency for people who don't like the test to say, well, it doesn't tell me anything. I therefore shouldn't do it. Um, but I think the the feeling that I get about this, particularly in pediatrics, but I think it applied everywhere, is it's part of that Swiss cheese model of not missing things, right? And so we layer on, you know, for, for things that are hard to find, right, or not slam dunked, or there's reasons that we wouldn't want to necessarily go to a CT scan, right? There's um, we layer on tests of, you know, different quality, right? And so we hope that kind of catch it in one of those different layers, whether it be in the labs or in the ultrasound or in the reevaluation or the PO challenge or the, you know, vital signs, all these different things kind of come together in the, in the way you're saying this is an art to say, okay, I've amassed enough data, enough convincing data that the probability that this patient is severely traumatized is, is below a, a, an acceptable threshold. Right. Um, and so I think that's a helpful way of kind of putting the the facts exam in the tools that we can use at the bedside, but not necessarily going to be the, you know, this is the deciding factor in all situations for all things. I don't know, does that make sense? Or is that kind of consistent the way you think about that? Yeah, I think it as another data point to take into my clinical decision making. I think in some aspects, depending on what resources you have available, sometimes you know, say you don't have the resources to monitor someone in the hospital, or you're not a place that could admit patients to the hospital, and you are concerned in that case, you know, I think a CT scan would be reasonable because that would rule it out for you, right? And you can just be able to, say, discharge the patient at that time. Um, so I think you also have to not only look at the patient, but also look at the resources you have available to be able to do, say, serial abdominal exams, Um and I think a lot of times the radiation that we have now is a lot less than what a lot of the original studies were talking about, you know, harm to children. Not that I like to scan children by any means, but um, if it's something that you're ever questioning, I think, you know, that is still an option. Gotcha. So let's let's kind of wrap this up here and and make it really practical, because I, I hate having conversations that are all academic in nature and that don't get down to the practical you know, what do I do? You know, I always feel like I come away from those like, well, great. That was, that was interesting, but now it doesn't help me in the, in the slightest. So let's get really practical for people here. Um, you know, providers working in the emergency department, maybe your trauma, you know, consultants, um, you know, who are consulting down in the, in the ED. If you're out in the community, not at a trauma center, right. And you see free fluid, this trace free fluid on the belly exam, should this prompt a transfer down into a trauma center, or should you work this up out there? Oh, <laughs> we'll start with some, start with a hard one. I was like, that's a tough one. Um, you know, like you said before, I've been in a lot of places in a lot of different parts of this country. And I think um, there are some fantastic providers that work at these little small centers who would very easily be able to do the clinical aspects of this, of, you know, following labs, doing a PO challenge and following abdominal exams. Um, you know, I don't think that you would necessarily have to send a patient into a trauma center unless they started having, you know, a change in exam or something like that where you were concerned. Now, what I would say though, is I also understand that sometimes you do not have those resources to be able to do that. And I think that if there's any question in your mind um, or you feel uncomfortable in any way, then I think then send them to the trauma center, if that makes sense. I don't think that any of this is something that you would necessarily have to send them in for like this particular patient, but if there was any amount of discomfort or, um, you know, you wouldn't be able um, or I guess the other thing too is how far you are from the trauma center if the patient was to change in, you know, in mm -hmm. clinical capacity, like, could you get them to the trauma center in a reasonable amount of time? So I think that's, that's a really hard question, Dr. Tabit, to like, just say blanketly. I think if, you know, a lot of people have a really good 
clinical acumen and they would be able to take care of this without sending it to a trauma center. Um, but then indefinitely, you know, there's always going to be that one case where the patient crashes and they actually really needed to go. So I think it it's really kind of a personal where you're working and what your resources are. I think it's a good answer. Um, I like to make questions hard. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're, you're kind of spot on, you know, there's, there's a lot of nuance in terms of the way systems, you know, manage kind of these gray zone patients. Um, and I think the only thing that I could add to what you're saying, what, what you said was great is, you know, we're at least in our system or in our region. And I think the same is probably true. Most other places is call the trauma center and just have a conversation, right? Uh, the call doesn't necessarily have to in initiate a transfer, but the conversation can be had and we can add a little bit of, um, you know, expect or a little bit of, um, you know, flavor to the conversation through experience um, that can help manage the patient and help make that decision as a team. Right. And so, um, you know, okay, that was a tough one. Um, but let's kind of bring it back down to kind of close to home for us, right. For us here um, at our trauma center. Right. And I, I know you've said the answer here. And so maybe we'll just use this as an opportunity to just kind of do a little bit of a repetition and for you just to tie the bow on this one really neatly. I go, you know, I leave this lecture, right. I go down and work a shift. Uh, the next patient I see is a 10 year old female who got into a car accident, who had some, you know, some moderate abdominal pain. I found, found some free fluid on the exam. You and I are working this one together. Go from there, recap this one for us, Casey, and just tell us what we're going to do. So for her, if she's, I would say if she's a reliable patient, I forgot to say that earlier too. If you have anyone that you're worried about a head injury or say, um, you know, sometimes you have patients who are autistic or something along those lines who you can't reliably exam. I think that's a different story. But if you have a reliable patient who you can examine, I would I would probably observe this patient. I would have we would get a set of labs, get lipase. I would have them get a repeat of a set of labs in six hours, make sure hemoglobin and hematocrit was stable. We would serial ex examine her during those six hours and do a PO challenge. And then once we got all the lab data and everything else, we'd probably reevaluate if we needed to scan or if we could um, you know, either send her home or if she was still showing some signs, you know, if she needed to be observed overnight. But I would start my first six hours, I think, would kind of determine then where we went from there. But with this amount of trace fluid, I would probably hold off on scanning this patient in particular. Great. Well, I think that's a great place to end it up. Um, thank you, Casey, for being here uh, as part of our conversation. I found this to be immensely helpful just to kind of think through you know, what can happen in these cases, you know, we, we go in expecting a very binary, obvious, easy answer. And we always come out disappointed because the answer is a lot more complicated than that in most situations. And so I think this is helpful as we go to the bedside and scan our pediatric patients. Uh, so with that said, that kind of wraps up the conversation uh, here, but I want to open things up. Um, we know we, I was able to ask a lot of questions of Dr. Kohler, but if you guys have any questions, um, I'd like to open up the opportunity to ask Dr. Kohler questions here. Um, so we'll just see what questions you guys have and let's go for it. Matt, can I ask one? Absolutely. Go ahead, Bob. So Casey, so suppose, I mean, let's say this kid fell off of a, a slide. They look really good. They've got some left upper quadrant tenderness. You see that trace amount of fluid only in the pelvis. They're hemodynamically stable. Their labs look good. Um, understanding that fast exam is not great for low level solid organ injuries. You don't see anything grossly abnormal with the spleen. You decide that, well, you observe the kid, the kid's playing, running around. How do you approach this child since this child could have a grade one or two splenic injury that you're just not seeing on ultrasound if you forego imaging, how do you then instruct the parents when the child goes home because there's a huge risk of re-bleeding and you've got an unknown potential low-level solid organ injury or low-grade solid organ injury? Yeah, so I would definitely give the parents very specific reasons to come back to the, oper or to the operating room, excuse me, the emergency department. Um, you know, increase in pain, if you're starting to see bruising, if the child's starting to be lethargic, uh, you know, I would go through nausea, vomiting, any little thing. Um, I would also say, 
that I would not have just because they might have a grade one or grade two injury. And we always say one week of no contact sports for each grade. So I would tell them at least two weeks of, you know, no contact sports um, just to be on the safe side. And, you know, you can have them follow up, but I think you'd have to have a really long discussion with the parents about what to look for um, and what to expect. And I also think that sometimes, you know, and this comes into patient autonomy is you have this conversation with the parents about, you know, the risks of sending them home without a scan. And some parents are very worried about it and would prefer to have their child scanned at that time. And I think you have to have that conversation about both, potentially both options, because I guarantee you a parent's going to ask you, is there anything else we can do? Um, and I think that sometimes you have to bring the patient into the conversation to see what they would also feel comfortable with. Thanks. No, oh, great question, Bob. I think that's um, definitely an important kind of topic because it's kind of one of those like, what do we need to know? And then one of those next steps beyond that in terms of making a safe disposition and plan for home. So no, I think that's great. Thanks. Any other questions that we have for uh, for Casey today? If not, I think we'll say that we thoroughly answered them. Um, but Casey, thanks so much for being a part of today's conversation. Really appreciate your your time and your expertise here uh, on this forum to kind of help us dive through a topic that's of interest to our, our ultrasound friends, but also our ED and trauma uh, colleagues as well. And so uh, we'll call it a wrap here. Um, thanks for joining us, everybody, on the Grand Rounds today. Uh, just for a little bit of an overview of the next couple of weeks, we have some pretty exciting topics coming up. So next week, we're going to do the same type of thing. Um, Dr. Ashish Anisha and I will be discussing pericardial effusions, tamponade, and some advanced ways of discovering how if the patient's in tamponade. And then the following week, we're going to be having a little bit of training uh, about transesophageal echo uh, from one of our cardiac anesthesiologists. So you definitely won't want to miss either of those. Look forward to having you back same time, same place, same Zoom link. And we'll see you next time we do this. So have a good week, guys.